this is still technically an unsolved case, so there's a lot to cover. And there's a lot, sadly, there's a lot of murders that happened in the area that it kind of, are they linked, are they not linked? So we don't know how many, and they can call the overall Long Island serial killer. But, and there's also a couple different Long Island serial killers, which I learned this week. And um, that was very confusing. There was a whole documentary about someone that wasn't, the cases I was covering and I got like halfway through without realizing that this was like a completely different law and island stuff. So this one is for the one from the Gelgo Beach Girls to the other murders or of victims that were found in the area. I'll talk about those too. Uh, so that's the one I'm talking about. Specifically were the bodies found around 2011 and and later than that. So to start it off, I'm going to talk about Shannon Gilbert, which is where a lot of people kind of start off with the story because she is a big part of this story. She's the primary um, person that's highlighted in the movie The Lost Girls, which was first a book and then became a Netflix movie about this case and about the girls in the case, but it really mostly focuses on Shannon and there's a lot of kind of mix up on whether or not Shannon is related to the other victims or if, if her death was an accident or was a different murder altogether and not linked back to everyone else because there are some things that don't line up MO wise but we'll get to that too. So uh, to start off so in May of 2010 this was a night May 1st that Shannon went out to a client's house Shannon was a, a sex worker, and that night she went, went with her driver, Michael, to a client's house. A little bit about Shannon. She didn't have too stable of an upbringing. She kind of went from foster care to different houses of foster care. She was close by to her family, and she had younger sisters and her mom close by, but she was in foster care, and they talk about that a little bit in the movie, too. There's, It was... Her mother said it was because she had bipolar disorder, and so she was kind of bounced around because it was difficult for her mother to manage working full time. And Tony had big dreams to go and do something bigger for herself. She actually graduated a year early and was a very smart young lady. And at first, she tried a couple of different jobs, like being a hostess and working at a hotel, but they didn't bring in the money that escorting did. So eventually she turned to escorting because it bring it brought in a lot more money. There were times that you can even make in one night, you could make what you it would take two to three weeks to make at a normal job if you try to do an hourly wage. So that's why a lot of females end up turning to escorting. So she turned to escorting around at this time she was twenty four. And um <clears throat> She at first she had a couple writings with the law, and this is why it's believed that she went towards Craigslist to advertise online for escorting. And I'll talk a little bit about more about why the escorts went to Craigslist. That's the commonality between all the victims is that they use Craigslist, Craigslist, sorry, to to advertise, and mostly because like before, if they were using an escort service, they would have to give up sometimes even more than half of what they would make a night to the escort ser- service to pay for the driver to, to give back to the escort service. And so for all the work you're doing, you're not getting a lot of the money back. And um, that's why a lot of times they would go off on their own. But what the escort service would provide was more security because they would send you with a driver who was also kind of like, you know, your bodyguard if anything went down. And also they were better at vetting their clients and there was more of a paper trail whereas on Craigslist you could really be talking to anybody so it made it a lot more riskier but it also was quicker money for the girls that were using it that way so that's where she had eventually went to advertise her services uh, and also she said started taking classes college classes at this time and that was expensive too so she had to she didn't get that money to pay for all these bills, and she was out on her own at this point. She did communicate with her mother. She was visited, and she actually sent a lot of money home to her mother and her sisters. 
so they they did have a relationship and her mother is a really important character in this later on but um it, she was not living at home with her mother at this time she was living with a boyfriend so on may 1st around 1 20 a.m Janine calls her driver michael and she says that she had finished up a call in manhattan and she needs to be picked up Short, shortly after that after she gets picked up, she gets another call from a guy named Joe who lives in Oak Beach, Long Island. And Oak Beach is about an hour and 50 minutes away from where she was. So it was quite a drive, but he offered to pay her $250 an hour, which was a pretty, which was a lot. And so it was hard for her to turn that down. So um, at around 2 a.m. in the morning, they go out for this call. It was pretty far away, but protocol for Shannon and her driver Michael was that Shannon would go inside and Michael would wait outside and in case anything went down he was there she needed him from there shortly after she arrived Joe comes out of the house with Shannon and they tell Michael that they're running an errand they were gone for about 15 minutes and then they come back to the house it's not clear what they were doing in that 15 minutes some people speculate they were going to pick up drugs other people think that they're going to pick up you know things for party like maybe mixers alcohol whatever but either way they were gone for 15 minutes and then they come back uh and after about two and a half hours of being there with joe joe comes out to michael at the car and he says something like she's freaking out in there she won't leave i want her gone come get her out of the house the this gentleman joe he told the star ledger that um that basically they had gotten into a fight and he wanted her to leave and that he went into the bathroom when, and when he came out, she was acting crazy. And he swore to this newspaper that during the time that, that they were together, that two and a half hours that they did not have sex and that he didn't give her any money. That could have been why she was freaking out. Who knows? But according to him, she was freaking out. So he went outside to get the driver. Michael comes inside to get Shannon, and he says that she's acting weird. Um, at this point, I'm, I'm sorry, at one point, Joe, the client, tries to grab her from behind, and she freaks out, as anyone would, and hides behind his couch. And then from there, she calls 911. A call was made at 4.51 a.m., and she was on phone with police. So the call that Shannon made to 911 at 4.51 a.m., this call is pretty wild because we don't even so she made this call all the way back in 2010 but they didn't release the this 911 call until 2022 and so they do have it released now and i think i have the link for it but it's just odd that it took this long to release it and also no one ever was dispatched for the call that shannon made to 911 and their reasoning for this was because apparently when she had called the 911 she told them that she was at Jones Beach and so they transferred her to another dispatch and then there was confusion about where she was so she kind of kept getting tossed around to different dispatch services and so that's why she was on the phone for so long but no one actually went out to check on her and I'll kind of come back to that because there's there's some issues with how they handled that but so she makes makes a call to 911 at 451 and then at this point, Joe, the client that she was with, basically checks out. He says that he doesn't want to deal with this, so he goes upstairs, according to Michael, the driver. Michael tries to get her out, but she was still on the phone at this point, and she wouldn't go. And so eventually, Michael gives up, and he, he says that he's leaving. And at this point, she kind of, like, snaps out of it, and she asks him not to go. But it's unclear whether she was scared of something in the house, whether she was having a reaction to something that she took whether she was having like psychotic break was kind of just like according to michael and joe she just she was going crazy Uh, but that's according to them so finally michael had enough at this point he goes to leave and he walks outside to his suv um and shannon goes running off basically just running off on her own michael still tries to look for her he starts driving up and down the street in his suv which is also strange because, like, he was supposed to be her safety net there, so for her to be avoiding him was strange, but he starts driving out to look for her once he loses her because she ran off on her own. 
she goes to a neighbor's house and frantically starts banging on the door and asking for help. It was an older man by the name of Gus that comes to the door. He said he was awake already shaving. So he he comes to the door and finds her freaking out. And he actually changed in his story a couple of times when he was talking to police. At first, he says that she came in and sat down with him and they talked. And and then another time he said that he she didn't come into his house at all. So that could just be him not remembering correctly or it could be him being sus. We don't know. There's not too much about Gus, though, from after this point. So I don't think he's any kind of a person of interest at all. So right before 5.22 a.m., Gus tells Shannon that this guy called the police to get help. And that scares her. And she ends up taking off from Gus's place again. 5 22 a.m and there are there are calls sorry phone records that show that Gus called the police and it shows that he was on the phone with them describing the incident with Shannon so that part we know um he said that when she left his home she ran to the middle of the road and then when she saw Michael's SUV coming down the road she hid under a boat in Gus's driveway Michael had come up the street and was calling out for her, and he even stopped and asked Gus if he had seen her. You know, he tried to make it, he tried to kind of brush it off, saying, oh, I'm looking for this girl. We were partying up here, and she ran off. I'm looking for her, da-da-da. And Gus said that he hadn't seen her, but he did sit, tell Michael that he called the police because of all the commotion. And Michael made this kind of weird comment that he shouldn't have done that, but also... She had an, was an escort, so maybe it was because of the fact that, you, like, if you're an escort, you're not supposed to get the police involved because, you know, stuff gets messy from there. And you can end up getting in trouble even if you're calling for help. So that could have been why he said that. But it just also odd that he said that to Gus, who just seems to be like a worried neighbor. So uh, while this is happening, Shin is, is hidden behind the boat in Gus's driveway, and she ends up taking out from there. She ends up running to two more houses, and Gus says that she ends up taking a right and, and running down, sorry, instead of taking a right and running out of the neighborhood, she ends up taking a left and going down a street called Anchor Way, which leads deeper into the neighborhood and away from the main Ocean Parkway. So uh, she was clearly lost. I mean, this place that she didn't work normally, so it's not shocking that she didn't know where she was going and didn't realize that she was going deeper into the neighborhood part. Uh, from here, she stops at one more house on Anchor Way and trying to get help. And that neighbor also called 911. And during this time, Michael is still looking for her. And Gus ends up going to the gate and waiting for police there. At 6 a.m., when it starts getting light out, Michael, the driver, decides to leave. And he said he left at 6, 10 a.m. Uh, and then... Around the same time is when the police arrive at the gate to meet Gus. So they hadn't arrived at the gate to meet Gus until 45 minutes after the phone calls were being made. At that point, it was about an hour and a half after Shannon's first 911 phone call is made. And again, like I explained, they didn't really link that phone call to Shannon until later. Uh, so when the police first show up, they don't do a search of the whole neighborhood and they really don't know what's going on. All they really know was that this woman was here meeting with Joe to, you know, to meet up and, and uh, engage in something. They don't really know. Actually, we don't, at this point, they don't know what her business was there. But they know that she took off and that she's been knocking on neighbors' doors. But for whatever reason, they decide not to do a search of the whole neighborhood. And they just kind of ask us some questions. So then from there, they kind of... It fizzles out. So no one was ever disp dispatched, like I mentioned, for the call that Shannon made. And uh, I kind of mentioned it was because of the confusion about where she was. So two days after Shannon, this happened with Shannon, her mom back home didn't know she was missing, neither did his, her sisters. Her boyfriend at the time did go looking for her because he knew that where she was going and he also was connected to Michael. So he tried to figure out where, where her last movements were and, like, why he left her there. Uh, and he hits a dead end pretty quickly. And, uh, again, it's, it's one of those situations where you don't, you can't really, like, say they're missing because then, then you have to answer a lot of questions with police and you could end up getting in trouble. 
So her boyfriend didn't just didn't report her missing, but her mother at this point, two days after, doesn't know that she's missing, just hasn't heard from her in a couple of days. So this event happened on May 1st, and on May 3rd of 2010, her mother receives a phone call from a man that introduces himself as Dr. Peter Hackett. And uh, this man asks Mary, her mother, if her daughter is there and, or if she is still missing. Those are his words, which is really creepy if you're a mother that doesn't know that your daughter is in danger. You just assume she's been working. So, so he tells Mary, her mother, that he runs a house for wayward girls and that Shannon had been with him right before she went missing and that she had taken and that and that he had taken care of her and taken her off the street after she knocked on his door. He said that he gave her a drug to calm her down and then she left with her driver and never returned. Um, his house, Dr. Peter Hackett's house, is on Anchor Way. And that's where the last 911 call was made that night from a, from another neighbor. So Dr. Peter Hackett lived right next door to the last neighbor that called 911 that night. The odd part, like I mentioned, was that the mother didn't know she was missing at this point. Also, Mary, the mother, couldn't understand how he even got her number. And when she asked Dr. Peter Hackett how how he got her number, he told her that any girl that he brings into the wayward home has to leave an emergency contact. But Mary said that Shannon would have never put her phone down, her would have never put her mother's phone down as her emergency contact. So that didn't make sense to her either. Uh, she gets off the phone with Dr. Peter Hackett. And at this point, she goes looking for Shannon because now this, this random man called her to ask if she was okay or if she had found her daughter. So she goes to look for her daughter because she didn't realize there was a problem at first. So they track her last movements and find out that she was last in Oak Beach and they try to make a report. But at first, when her mom tries to make the missing person report, she gets kind of bounced back and forth between Long Island, where Shannon went missing, and New Jersey, where she's actually from. And they end up going and making the report in New Jersey. So that gets confusing, too, when people are looking for her in Long Island. It's jurisdiction issues and stuff like that. So um, because there is, um, because this is is in New Jersey, this is also a reason why that 911 call made for Shannon isn't linked back to her for another four months after because of this confusion. The... After this, the investigation into her disappearance has barely anything, whether it's because of the jurisdiction issue or because Dr. Hackett. But also, Dr. Hack Hackett says that he never made that call. And this is where Dr. Hackett looks real sketch because he says, so when the, the investigation isn't being taken seriously, Mary actually shows up at Dr. Hackett's house to put up flyers for miss for her missing daughter and this is the first time that dr hackett says he talks to mary he said that he had never talked to her before and he swears up and down that he never made a phone call to mary and that he has no wayward home for girls and that it's all nonsense made up by mary which in what world would a mother make up the fact that this man called her if at the point of this phone call mary had no idea shannon was even missing so his whole mindset makes no sense it's also proven later that the phone call from dr hackett did come from did happen from phone records and that he called from his wife's cell phone and the even weirder part about it is that he made the call while he was in new jersey not too far from mary's home so it's never really been sorted out which story adds up but they have records showing that he made a phone call from his wife's cell phone so the part of him saying he didn't Mary until she showed up to hang up flyers is clearly a lie. So uh, he also this Dr. Peter Hackett guy. I guess that he's a he's been known to be a serial exaggerator, and that he has a history of making up stories that has actually gotten him in trouble in his personal life and professional work in professional life. He kind of like over exaggerates things and likes to include himself in any of the hot gossip that goes on. 
So some people that knew him said it could have just been him trying to get involved in a story. Maybe he saw her that night. Maybe she did come by his house and he, whatever, and he did try to help her because obviously he needs to get Mary's number from somewhere. So some people say that he might have just been calling to get involved with the investigation because he's a super curious kind of dramatic guy. But I think overall he's very sus and we'll get back to why he's even more sus in a bit but police from here actually clear dr peter hackett and that he's not a person of interest and they also clear michael the driver and joe the client that she went to go see that night so from here that's kind of as far as we get with shannon at this point and we're going to come back to her in a bit but after this the summer goes on and it kind of goes into fall and there's not really any There's not much of a search operate put into play to find Shannon. They don't know that she's missing. They know whereabouts she went missing from. But there's no, like, search party, anything like that. And actually, the police did say that that her profession was one of the reasons they weren't looking for. They actually admitted to that, which is sick. But they said that that's one of the reasons they didn't take it too seriously because of her profession it wasn't uncommon for girls like in that profession to go missing and not you know show up for a long time or maybe go off or disappear and all this stuff and it's because their profession is is risky is how they put it so I just thought that was really messed up to even highlight that I mean and so there was this one officer that went to the area where Shannon went missing from pretty often and he brought his German shepherd dog named blue and he would bring him there to try to track the scent shannon and he admitted that he never thought that he would find anything by doing this but he just figured it had been a while and it was mostly like a training exercise for his dog so he was out there for a few weeks and after a few weeks into december he started focusing on areas close to ocean parkway because he had actually read somewhere that when a body is dumped, it will be within 30 feet off the road. So he went into that area thinking it's a good place to look and a good place for the training exercise. And the place where he's looking to called the beach, it's Gilgo Beach, and there's Oak Beach next to it. But it's more of like a marshy area because there's like really thick grass and weeds and thorns. It's not really like a beach that you go tanning on. It's kind of just like it's next to the ocean but it's it's a tough place to it's a place where a body could easily be lost because of how just difficult it is to walk through so this is where he takes his dog to for this training exercise and on december 10th the dog signals that he has something and from here along the side of a four-lane ocean parkway the officer follows blue into the marsh And it's there that he finds a burlap sack holding skeletal remains, but the skeletal remains were not Shannon. The remains were of a young escort named Melissa, who went missing in July of 2009. And then a couple days later after this, the police find three more sets of remains, all skeletal at this point, all wrapped in a burlap sack and laid in a short distance from one another. And um, they were all petite escorts and they had all all four of the women found were using craigslist to advertise their services and so from here they find these four bodies and these four women will be known as the gilgo beach four but again none of these are shannon police announced on january 5th 2011 that they were looking for a serial killer and they continued to look through the land but at this point it's january it's on long island and the winter really slows them down at this point so they kind of slow down the investigation out in that area and start focusing on the four victims that they had found when they're looking into the four victims that they had found they discover their names are megan maureen and amber along with melissa which was the first one And these women, they tried to find links from these women to the guys that they already had. They they had Dr. Peter Hockett. None of the girls had any connection to him. They tried to find a connection with them and Michael, the driver. There wasn't one. And they tried to look into a connection between them and Joe, 
from the client and there wasn't one with him either. Also, there was a difference between how these girls went left that night, I guess, compared to how Shannon did. None of these girls had a driver with them when they met up with this with their client that night. And all four of the girls, when they had set up meetings with this person, the person meeting them that night used a burner phone, where with Shannon, uh, the, her client, Joe, was open about who he was and used his own phone. So that's the, another reason people say that she might not be linked back to these four girls, at least. <clears throat> so... They try to look into background of the girls that were found, try to find links just between them. They weren't able to find a link between them, but also they were all using Craigslist. And if you remember Craigslist, which was at its peak back in 2011 and 2010, it uses that IP address or, or that kind of like hides your email because it gives you a Craigslist email that you work through. So it was difficult to track people down on it. And also, whoever was communicating with the girls through Craigslist was finding a way to hide their own IP address. So whoever this was knew how to hide their own IP address and also knew to use a burner phone. So he might be a little tech savvy. Um, I'm sorry, he knew how to hide the VPN. So if you're a tech person, you might know more about that. But that's basically hiding your IP address, I think. <laughs> so whoever this was, had a good understanding of tech, at least. So they also police believe that the girls maybe knew this guy or knew him enough to be comfortable and let their guards down with him because they went with them and a couple of the girls went with this person without their purse or cell phone, which if you are a sex worker, is that's like an, a no-no. Like it's a rule to always have your cell phone and purse with you and, and there were a couple of us found without it. So they believe that he either knew them or made them feel comfortable. One of the stories of one of the victims, Amber, she was last seen, when she was last seen, her roommate said that she had gotten a call for a $1,500 night. And that was a lot higher than usual. And it was something that you just couldn't pass up. And that was kind of the story with the other girls too. They got, they got this call and they were promised a larger amount of money than they normally would have gotten. So they kind of went with it. And um, whoever came to pick her up, they arrived to her house at 9.45 p.m. And her roommate actually walked her to the end of the driveway and said goodbye. And he said that something that haunts him to this day was that when he went to say goodbye, if he had just walked 10 more feet, he would have seen the guy and he would have known what, or at least seen what the car looked like. And he would have had more for police, but he didn't. And he said it's something that he thinks about constantly. So that's really rough to think about that you know just going a little bit further you could have helped a little bit so it's i feel for that guy because that just it sucks to know so um let's see actually oh so the, another thing that goes along with the idea that he was someone that the girls might have known and this is really freaky is that one of the first the first victim that was found, Melissa, the killer had been using her cell phone to call Melissa's little sister. He called a few different times. This happened before the murder investigation. It was while Melissa was missing. Um, her family hadn't been, hadn't been able to get a hold of her, and her younger sister named Amanda started getting calls from a phone saying that it was Melissa. So the caller ID said it was Melissa. So when she picked up, on the other end, it was a man. And he would just start saying a bunch of really terrible things to her. He would ask her if she was a whore like her sister. He would share info about Melissa and Amanda. And um, he would always call around 5.30 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. And it would always keep the phone conversations less than 90 seconds. So he, it seems that he knew that that's a lot, how long it would take to track the phone number. So he was smart enough to hang up before that. Um, and whenever he did call, he would call from a heavily populated area. So when the police would try to ping his cell phone from the calls, they always they would always show up in either Times Square or like Madison Square Garden or just these very busy places that like would kind of lead to dead ends. Um, all of that after all these calls happened, they fit a pattern except for the last one. The last time he called, he said, "I finally killed your sister, and I'm watching her body rot." 
then when the police traced that call, they found out he made that call from Gilgo Beach, and that's where her body was later found. So he's making these calls before she's even been found. Um, um, so from these calls happening, the press actually gets a get wind of these calls being made and the police trying to track them from there and the press publish it and from here the calls stop altogether i mean so it's one of those things that probably were was being or was tried to be held within the police station and then it got out and because of it they don't have anyone calling the sister amanda anymore so Make sure to keep note about the sister Amanda getting these calls because that actually comes back later when I'm going to talk about some suspects. So it's something to remember. So from here, they are still searching the area. They're still looking through this marshy area. And the case dies out for a bit, like I mentioned, because of the weather. But once the spring comes back around on March 29th of 2011, police find skull, find a skull and hand and a forearm, and these remains were found on Ocean Parkway near the initial Giggle Beach Ford, but further away, about three-fourths of a mile from the other Ford. Uh, this victim was not in a burlap sack. She isn't in the same row, and she also had been dismembered, which the Giggle Beach Four had never been dismembered. The only parts that remain were... The parts that were missing from this victim were actually had been found previously years before. So a torso of a body was found back in 2003 in a city way inland called Manorville. And this victim turned out to be a woman by the name of Jessica, who was also an escort that used Craigslist for her services. They keep searching the beach from here and they found on April 4, 2011, they find three more body parts, another skull, hand, and a foot that belonged to another victim that they had already had the torso of that had been displayed in Manorville also. And to this day, this victim has never been identified and she's only known as the, Man the Manorville Jane Doe because that's where her torso is found. So there's two torsos found in Manorville and now they're, the rest of them are being found over here in Gilgo Beach. Um, near the same area, actually, I have a map of this, so I'm gonna put that up. Here we go. This kind of shows you where these bodies are turning up and how some of them are bundled together and others, they're going a bit further down. And the beaches are, the first one is Jones Beach, and then in the middle, it's the Gilgo Beach, and then in the end, it's Oak Beach. So, that's why they're going to continue to go down through Oak Beach and they find more bodies that way. Near the same area, but a bit further down, police find two more bodies. And these bodies were different from the ones before. First, they find the body of a young Asian male. And this body was intact and it was dressed and he was dressed in female clothing. But to this day, they haven't been able to identify this young Asian male. And then they also find in the same area, they find the body of a baby girl it's, who is still unidentified to this day. And they said that this, uh, this body was between the ages of 16 months to 32 months, which is about one to three years old. Uh, like I said, still not identified. So at this point, there's eight victims and the, it's, it's just kind of get more intense from here. But like I mentioned, the Gilgo four have very common I guess, traits or MO, and then they're finding more bodies along the way. So it's kind of unclear, is this one killer, two killers? Is this a dump site for many killers? There's not really any anything to show either way right now. So they start to, from here, they still search the area, and they end up finding a, oh, they, they do try to figure out if the, the woman that was a Jane Doe is related to the baby Doe, and they actually have no relation. But on April 11th, police find two more sets of remains in, in two separate areas. And this time they find those remains on Jones Beach, which is the one on the right. One of the remains is the bones and jewelry of a woman that's linked by DNA to the baby that was found all the way on the other side of the island. 
Um, and the second one is linked to a set of legs that actually wa washed up on the beach of Long Island way back in 1996. So now there's 10 bodies going back as early as 1996. 10 bodies and still no Shannon, which was the one that they originally went out there to look for. During this time, all these bodies being found creates this kind of rift between the police department and the prosecutor's department because there's a disagreement between what they're looking for. The Suffolk County Police Department commissioner at the time, named Richard Dormer, he thought this was one serial killer and that Shannon might not, e might not even be involved at all, while other people in the, uh, well, the district attorney, sorry, said it was two killers and didn't mention Shannon at all. So there's a lot of confusion and also like with media trying to cover this story, they don't even know what they're writing about because every day they're just finding more bodies and none of them are like linked to each other. So it's just a really messy situation, especially since you're worried that there might be a killer on the loose and it's just chaos, pure chaos. So uh, like I mentioned, so there's two distinct different patterns here. There is there's a possibility that you could have two different killers. Yeah. They believed that the um, Gilgo Beach Four were killed by a trophy killer, basically because of the way that he, in the same way that you would hunt deer and put the heads on the wall, the way that this killer kind of lined up his victims in an orderly way was almost as if he could drive by them whenever he wanted and kind of like see his trophies. And that's why they, they refer to him as a trophy killer. The other killer for the other victims was, was known as the torso killer. This is because this killer dismembered the bodies of the victims. And when they did put the torsos, when they did separate the torsos, they put the torsos on display. One of them was found in a golf course. So it was more of a show, whereas the Go Go Beach 4 was kind of more hidden and more private, like just for him. Uh, so it's kind of, that's the confusion. Is it possible for two completely different serial killers to be using the same dump site? Is that more believable or less believable than one guy using the dump site for himself and just having completely different MOs? That's where it gets kind of kind of messy. So. And still along with that, there's still victims that where they have the John Doe and the baby who are un un unidentified. Um, there's also thought that the John Doe maybe was killed because uh, the killer picked them up and didn't know that they were a male and then killed them simply because they turned out to be a male and they were angry about it. So he could still be linked to these other ex escorts. So from here, there's a few suspects, and there's also a possibility that whoever it is could be linked back to other victims. And let me see. Let's see. Okay, so. Okay. I'm just trying to think if I should go back. The suspects are to be other bodies first, but yeah, because it gets kind of, it gets kind of wild. Like I mentioned, so there's there's possibility of two separate killers. There's also very different types of killers. They believe that the trophy killer is not flashy and that he's doing it, like I mentioned, for himself, and that the torso killer is more flashy. He does it for the shop. So it, it could also be possible that once the Gilgo Beach Four were found, that this torso killer started dumping body parts in the area simply to get some some clout, some publicity. That was a theory too, that was basically once the girls start getting found, he's like, oh, no one's talking about my torso killings anymore. He starts getting a little jealous about the attention someone else is getting. And so he starts dumping body parts in that area specifically to be talked about again, which is wild. I mean, I guess if, if you're a flashy killer and, and you like the shock factor, it makes sense that he would try to go back and get some of that. So around the uh, following winter, there's still no Shannon, and her family is still pushing for police to search for her, and they specifically want police to search for her in the backyard of Dr. Peter Packett, the same creeper from before. And 
the police in December of 2011, this is a year and a half after, actually a little bit more than a year and a half after she had gone missing. Police finally get permission to drain the marsh area near Dr. Hackett's house. And on December 13th of 2011, many victims of the females that had been found gathered together to hold the vigil. And on that same day, they found Shannon's remains. And Mary, her mother, was actually brought to the marsh area. And she actually was able to look out on the marsh area from Dr. Hackett's back porch because they had the best view of the area. Like, that's a red flag. But she she stood on the porch and was able to watch the crime scene technicians and everything uh, collect Shannon from the back, from this marsh area. So they literally found Shannon right by Dr. Peter Hackett's house. But according to police, he's still cleared. He has, like, serious red flags going on, but the police say that they stick to their conclusion that Dr. Peter Hackett is cleared, even though he made that weirdo phone call and the body's found right by his house and he was basically the last one to see her alive. They cleared him. And Dr. Peter Hackett really tried to like boast about the fact of like what if I had killed her, why would I have let police search my backyard? But he also didn't let police search his backyard for like for a year or more longer than a year and a half after. So it's like Sure, but you could have also just been waiting for the body to decay to, you know, to the point that it wouldn't be easy to link you to it. He just thinks he's smart, and I don't like that guy. So she was found on Oak Beach, closest actually to the unidentified child and furthest away from all the other victims. She was also found laying face up, and she was not wrapped in anything, so no, no burlap sack, and she also was not dismembered. She was found a quarter mile, I'm sorry, a quarter, a quarter mile from where she was found, they found her belongings, which included her jeans. And the jeans, it was said, seemed to have been removed by her. And before there was even an autopsy, police tri- the police commissioner says that it was an accident. They said that because Shannon had a history of bipolar disorder, and they said that her mental illness combined with the use of alcohol or drugs could have caused her to have a mental break and she ran into the mar ran into the marsh area uh because she believed she was running from something and there she succumbed to the element uh and once they eventually did do an autopsy they couldn't even determine cause of death the, f- the theory that they went with was that because she was having a mental break she had an episode and she got confused and ran into the marsh and since she had no idea where she was she could have suffered from hypothermia and fell down and then they said drowned in the six to eight inches of water even though she was found face up that was their theory so it's a bit far-fetched since she wasn't even found face down in the water to say she drowned but they believed that she succumbed to the elements um also something that they did find on her from doing the autopsy was that she was missing her hyoid bone and your hyoid bone is like a really small bone in your neck, and it's really small, so it could have been carried away by animals, or it could have been lost in the marsh. But also, a missing hyoid hyoid bone. Oh my goodness, hyoid bone is also points to strangulation. So this is why her family did not agree with the findings of of the original autopsy. And in 2012, she was. Uh, when her death was said to be an accident, they got her uh, exterior, the exterior of her remains tested for drugs. They didn't find any drugs on the exterior of her remains. And um, and they could have used her like bone marrow to test for drugs. So it's odd that they used her exterior, her exterior of her remains for testing, but they never really explained why they did it that way. Uh, I don't know. Maybe they could have found more if they went for bone marrow, but maybe there's a reason they they couldn't. Uh, so she was also left in this really desolate area. It was like salt water and wind. And uh, maybe it was because like the bones wouldn't tell you much after being through that for over a year and a half. But they never tested all that. They concluded uh, that Shannon's death had nothing to do with the other murders. And also 
but also it was just a coincidence that her going missing led them to a serial killer. Shan's family, though, has never believed it was an accident, and they also never believed Dr. Peter Hackett, understandably so. Eventually, there was a second autopsy done by the New York City Medical Examiner, and they said there there was no there was insufficient evidence to determine any definite cause of death, but says that the autopsy findings are con- consistent with strangulation, and they believe doc and the family believes Dr. Peter Hackett is responsible. He, there's also this wild theory that goes into Shannon's death that um, the whole community might be in on it, which I'm just gonna throw it out there. I don't really. It's very far fetched. It was like this kind of like this Reddit post mixed with another post that I found. It was like saying that because they all they all trust Dr. Peter Hackett and he's like a a pillar in the community that they all chose to kind of cover it up with him. And like even though he was sketchy and even though the call was sketchy, they all decided to you know rally behind him. It's kind of far fetched, but I'll throw it out there. Uh, also, the area that she was found in, this marshy area, is very difficult to walk through, and it's even more difficult to carry a body through. That's another reason they believe it could have just been an accident. But to leave her to the other girls also was kind of out there in case maybe this was just like a, you know, because she was already running around that night, but someone found her, maybe someone linked to the other girls, and it was more just a crime of opportunity. And it was more of a coincidence that she was, you know, she was advertising on Craigslist like the other girls and that she was also an escort. So eventually her case, her death was ruled an accident and this case was closed by the police. And like I mentioned before, the 911 call with her was never released until 2020, until this earlier this year. So they had many, many years, and I listened to the 911 call. I was going to play it for you guys, but because it's, like, from a YouTube video and it's being recorded from a live press conference, it, the sound is really off. So I'm going to try to – I'm just going to post the link here. I think I sent it to myself. Let's see. If you want to listen, uh, the 911 call starts at around – I think it starts around like eight fifty on the on the YouTube. So I'm gonna just pin it here, and it like you can hear in the nine one one call. It's a really confusing. They they do throw her around to a bunch of different areas for dispatch, and it it's just it's like at first she seems pretty like calm almost, but I also feel like it could have just been her being calm because she realizes they don't know where she is and she doesn't know where she is. So uh, then it kind of gets hectic because she starts getting frustrated, understandably so. So, but but the overall that one call lasts for a bit, and it's kind of wild that they didn't they didn't conclude that it was even her until so many months later, and they didn't even release it until way later. So it's kind of interesting that they felt they had to keep it. It could also be because they looked bad from this nine one one call because they couldn't figure it out and because they were tossing it around to so many different lines. It's just like if someone's calling you for help and you, you know, and you can't figure out where they are, I don't think you should be tossing them around. I think you should be keeping them on the phone and trying to get clues to where they are before you do that. But maybe that's why they didn't release it for so long. Um, but, yeah, so that's where, where they are at with Shannon. And also, there was a bit of issues with this area and with the, within the police of this area, too. And the police didn't even ask for the FBI. I mean, they they have at this point, they had 10 bodies and now they have Shannon too. Uh, so 11 at this point. And they didn't even bring the FBI in until 2015. So a few years after. And there was a lot of questions as to why they waited so long. And it was said it was due to, it could have been because there was corruption in the police department at this time. I guess the chief of Suffolk County had a history of drinking and driving and drugs. And he also had a history of uh, knowing a lot of prostitutes in the area. And so maybe they were trying to keep it within their police department because there were some links to police. So there's another thought that it could be a much bigger cover up. But really, other than the fact that the police chief was corrupt in his own drinking and driving and, and having a history with prostitutes, there wasn't 
too much else to say that the police are late to it. But of course, if you have any more thoughts on that, feel free to come up after and chat about it. So um, there is the thought that whoever was doing this may have been connected to police to the law enforcement simply because they knew about the fact that you can't stay on the phone for more than 90 seconds because they'll leave, the, they'll trace the call and the fact that they knew to cover up their IP address and like little things like that, the tech stuff, they thought maybe they could have been linked to the law enforcement. Uh, but along with the suspects, the overall suspects that they've had in this time, and there's a couple interesting ones. Obviously, Dr. Peter Hackett is a suspect early. It never was named a suspect by the police. They cleared him, but he's a suspect in my eye. And they also cleared the client, Joe. But there's a few other suspects, and one of them is named John Betrol. And I think I have a picture of him. Oh, no, I have a picture of Dr. Peter Hackett, though. This is Dr. Peter Hackett. He just looks like a creep. I'm just going to put him up And so this gentleman, John Petrol, he was a, a family man with no violent criminal history, but his brother was arrested for violating a protection order. When, and when his brother got arrested, they took his brother's DNA. And this DNA matched a, the rape and murder of two women who were strangled and posed, but it wasn't a full match it was only a partial match and so because of this they were able to trace it back to uh the brother john betroth at to his dna he lived just a few miles from where the torsos were discovered and actually his daughter grew up with grew up to be best friends with melissa the first victim that was found from the Gilgo beach four so the reason that he stands out so much is because Remember, Melissa's sister, Amanda, was the one getting phone calls, that very taunting phone calls, really insulting phone calls, where the person was asking her, you know, are you a whore like your sister? And knowing information about Melissa and her sister, Amanda, that was strange that he would know, especially if Melissa was, you know, a crime private opportunity through Craigslist. So they've linked this back to John since John's daughter grew up with Melissa. He would know all about her family. And so that just kind of adds to this. He ended up going to jail for the other two mur murders of those two women, but he has never been officially linked back to uh, Melissa or the other Gilgo Beach Four, but he is a suspect in those. There was another man by the name of James Bassett. He owned a nursery, uh, sorry, he owned, yeah, like a plant nursery. I think that's called a nursery still. Yeah. Um, he owned a nursery on Long Island. And so he was kind of sus because this would give him access to all the burlock sacks that the Gilgo Beach Four were found in. And, uh, but they really weren't able to get too many answers from him because he committed suicide just a few days after Shannon's body was found. Um, and then the last one, the last suspect is really interesting because this is the name, um, oh, I'm sorry, there's two more. So the next one is a gentleman by the name of Neil Falls, and he is brought up because there was, there was a base story about him back in 2015. He was in West Virginia. He went to the home of a sex worker named Heather. And while he was there, he pulled a gun out on her and he, she fought him and Heather ended up shooting Neil Falls in the head and killing him. Um, when police got there, they found four sets of handcuffs on him. And then in his car was a machete, axes, knives, sh shovel, a sledgehammer, bleach, trash bags, bulletproof vest, and um, uh, clean white socks and underwear. So... He had basically a whole kill kit in his car. Um, and they tried to link Neil Falls back to missing or, or murdered escorts from that area and from across eight different states. And so there's a possibility he could have been list, or, but there's no, other than the fact that he has his kill kit, he's obviously gone now. So there's no way to really link him back to those girls otherwise. And he was fine. He was in West Virginia when he was killed um but he could have just been traveling up and down doing this so that's kind of the thing if he's dead now we don't really know too much he's just a little he's a suspect 
Um, there's the last one I'll talk about is the Eastbound Strangler. So this case is from back in 2006. Four women, and I have a map showing this one, where these women were found compared to... Oh, I got to shrink it down. Hold on. Sorry. Um, there were four women that were found defrauding out. There you go. Need any trick? There were four women that were found and later identified as escorts. Um, they were found in a drainage ditch behind the Golden Key Hotel outside of Atlantic City. And if you if you PTR, this is where Atlantic City is, and that's where the other victims were found over in Long Island. Um, the This one kind of is odd because they were found behind this hotel in a drainage ditch, but they were found all placed face down about 60 feet apart from each other, and they were all found in a row, and all of their heads were facing, facing east towards Atlantic City. Uh, 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 sorry, Atlantic City. Um, they were all clothed except for their socks and their shoes had been removed and their cause of death was strangulation for all of them. Um, they were found in 2006 and the first body from the Gilbo four girls was when missing in 2007. So if these, these four girls here are linked back to the Gilbo Beach girls, it, it would almost seem like if this is the same guy, he's like, if he's a trophy killer, as they believe he is, he's doing like these sets where he set up these four girls and then he moved on to uh, Gilbo Beach, puts those ones up, drives by them whenever he wants. And if that is the case, then did he just move on to another location or did he get scared because they started finding bodies? Um, who knows? And also, they think that maybe the two, the two killers, if there are two separate killers, it's possible that maybe um, the only thing that kind of links back to it being one is maybe they got confident over time. And at first they felt like they had to dismember bodies and to get away with it. And then later on, they decided they wanted to keep it themselves. But it's kind of strange for one killer to change MOs completely like that. So um, that's basically the suspects that I have and the people that stand out to me with this Long Island serial killer. It's still unsolved today. If you look up Long Island serial killer, there's actually like two or three. So it does get confusing, like I mentioned before, with like knowing if it's, you know, the one that was caught or not. The, the one that was caught is like a whole other thing. And I might cover that one eventually, but he's not the one from these killings and he's not been linked to any of these killings. He's those His killings happen like a different side of Long Island. Apparently a lot of stuff's going on on Long Island, but... um. Yeah, so these ones specifically, it's still unsolved today, and they still have a murderer on their hands, as far as they know. Um, they do have a new police police commissioner, and he's the one that officially decided to release the 911 call. Um, so you can see him. I forget his name, but you can see him here in the in the uh, link. Um, so maybe there is some hope for there to be a lot of change up in the department and maybe we can get more answers um because it was so hush hush and like i said that could have been because they look so bad during the whole thing but um we'll see well i don't know that the last time they ever released anything about it was when they released the 911 call back in 2022 yeah this year i think it was in may so I, it seems like they are making moves and they might come out with some more stuff if they do have more ev evidence, but it's just really, I think it's wild to think that two different killers are using the same dump site, but it's not impossible. And also I think it's kind of, it's, it's interesting to think that maybe this is just like a known dump site or maybe it was like a father-son duo where like he showed him the ropes and then was like this is where I leave my bodies it's like you know kind of maybe someone taught the next person to use that spot um 
So there's a lot of different theories running around, but um, let me get to the, um, yes, <laughs> I'm going to look at the chat now, but yeah, um, Jennifer, enter the weirdest document, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, I'm just reading through it. If anyone wants to come up, feel free to raise your hand. Um, hey, Jennifer, it's been a long time. Hey, Charlie. Hi. Sorry. This is one of my favorite unsolved cases. Um, and I was in and out because my inner mind is making me crazy. Um, but did you talk about the police officer that had the bag stolen from his vehicle? No. What? No, it was not I don't, I didn't see that part. Um, now I'm going to have to look it up. Um, yeah, yeah. He, I think it was the police chief then, James Burke. Do you know, yeah, his name is James Burke. And there's a, there's a podcast and I know Billy Jensen is kind of, you know, like there's stuff going on with Billy Jensen and his behavior, but they, he and, uh, his, whatever his podcast partner did a whole series on it um mm. and they talked to a guy that i think they talked to the guy who stole the bag and that's kind of how the story starts but in the gin bag there were all kinds of things that were like not good mm. <laughs> um it had sex toys a pornograph a pornographic dvd and viagra um and he's he was sentenced to 46 months in federal prison in 2016 for assault and conspiracy. So he assaulted the guy who stole his duffel bag. Oh, yeah. But I don't think they ever, like, officially tied him to any of the murders. But it was strange that, like, I think he stole it right before they started finding the body. It's, was he the police chief? That was yeah. like okay. So I did mention the police chief. I didn't know exactly what the what was. I didn't know what the duffel bag part, but um, I did say that the police chief had like corruption, and that's why they might have waited to bring in um, the FBI because there was a lot of shit going on in their department. But I didn't realize they had linked him to or had him be a potential for the crimes itself. Yeah, and it looks like uh, an escort came forward and said that she was at a party in 2011 in Oak Beach and she saw Burke drag a woman of Asian appearance by the hair to the ground. Oh, shame. Um, then she, and I think they talked to her as well. Um, she later in, at another party in August, 2011, she decided to engage in sexual activity with him. And she said he violently yanked her head during oral sex. Um, and that he threw the money at her afterward. And I think this was a party with a bunch of other police officers and stuff. Yeah. Wow. It's, it's bad. Like, it's bad. <laughs> he looks very, very guilty of, of something, but I don't know if it's... Now, also, we're leaving out the, the the big shock of the story, unless I didn't hear it, where Shannon Gilbert's sister killed her mom. She killed her mom? Yeah, Lori. What? Yeah, I didn't even see that. Yeah, am I looking at old articles? I thought he killed her mom. Yeah, so Slinner had a Lost Girls? Yeah, it's in the Lost Girls. Oh, I think it's in the Lost Girls. Reading like that well, her sister had gone to a psychiatric hospital. But I guess I didn't read the part that she killed her mom. She, yeah, she was stabbed to death by Sarah in Sarah's apartment in 2016. She's the one who suffered from schizophrenia. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's a, I think there's an episode of, oh God, what's the name of it? Oh, oh, it's on Discovery, something monster. And they actually had to do the interviews through like virtually because it was the, the interview was done during COVID, Mm -hmm. but they show the police, like the, their vest cameras and the other sister is outside screaming bloody murder like oh my like what did you do what did you do yeah so there's only one sister left jeez um i am reading that part now so sorry thank you jennifer this is why i love you which i <laughs> i i did not that went over my head i was so i was so fixated on like the linking all these bodies together I yeah i mean that, it's like so it spans so much right like uh, it's not just a serial killer but it's a serial killer probably in the neighborhood the neighborhood protected themselves because they're super shishi and they don't want people digging in their business and then other bodies show up here and other bodies show up there and they all are kind of weird and then her sister kills her mom. Like, it, there's a whole bunch of things going on. <laughs> so it's like, is that whole place, like, curious to be believe in that? Of like, yeah. That, <laughs> and like, that yeah. messy. That yeah. plot build. I remember reading the end of it. I remember in the movie, like, there was, like, this, so, there was so much tension between those two characters. But I think, I don't know, I must have been typing when they did like at the end of the movie when they put up all the words and i don't think i really read them and that probably was why and shoot i yeah i missed that whole thing but that's wild that that happened because mary like there's so much there was a, i did start to listen to the long i there's a few po- podcasts about it and one of them there's like there's like three or four seasons all on this one case and so i had listened to the first five episodes and they they interview like the boyfriend, the driver, um, and they really get more into detail about Shannon's relationship with her mom and how she like a lot of people when didn't take her mom seriously at first either because people would say like oh you know who that is like she didn't even care about Shannon stuff like that and so I know that there was a lot of tension in their relationship and then on top of it like for her to go missing and her mom trying to fight to find her. But that's like wild to me that that ended up happening with her sister because it's like, I don't like who know it. Do they know if it because of that? Did they? It, was it like frustration between the two of them because of the oh, of shit? I I don't I don't remember. I would imagine that there was a lot of tension before, and I I watched the movie a long time ago, so I don't remember it all, and I don't remember a lot mm-hmm. of stuff. But it's like. Mary was trying to do her best and it just never was enough to keep everybody out of trouble, I think. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think, and I think there was tension between the sisters and all those things. Um, but I'd have to look at it again to really like remember what was going on. I I pulled it up. It says that she had gone to, her daughter had gone to her home, to Mary's home, because she was hallucinating. And then it says that Mary died while trying to help her mentally ill daughter. So maybe she was having a psychotic break. Maybe. Um, Yeah. Yeah. So it might not have had to do with Shannon, but maybe just the overall stress and everything actually that goes along with grieving didn't help her situation mouse no. oh yeah so yeah i'm just going to do extra tidbit i know when you were like did you mention the twist i was like i mentioned all the twists jennifer <laughs> <laughs> i'm not that sorry on the ball can we go yeah this thing has layers do you have any theories about like if it's two killers if it's multiple killers just using the same dump site it, or anything like that i mean it's We've, we've talked about so many different cases and this really does feel like at least more than one, um, using the same area for a really, really long time, because if you 
go back like to the 90s or whatever there were bodies there from then so it was it feels like it was a i don't want to say popular but a good place for them to jump because it like nobody was looking until the shane and gilbert situation so yeah i feel like it is more than one at least and then there's so many there, there's differences between the groups like you said the mo like a lot of it was with sex workers but then there's the guy and the baby so it's those i feel like are kind of maybe one-offs um yeah i don't know who would kill a baby um well yeah but you know and then the four girls in um atlanta shitty too feel like a completely different person as we said yeah just my yeah. <laughs> one of the things that kind of stood out to me and that i i feel like and i'm gonna put my tinfoil hat on with david here i'm gonna i'm gonna go all out with this one it's not my actual theory what i believe but I, it, it's a theory is that it could be something that like like kind of what was being talked about in the chat a little bit like maybe it is a bigger cover-up as far as the community and maybe the police and because these the other escorts that were found they they could have also known police and maybe it just became a common thing like oh if something happens and you can't get out of it if you have to kill them this is where we dump them and we can just link it back to a serial killer is that like yeah wow. you know yeah, we sorry um you're like cutting in and out, so I don't know when you're finished. Because my you're not a piece of shit. Um, <laughs> I'm calling them after we get off of this. Um, but yeah, so I mean, the police were into some nefarious shit, right? So they could have spread their ideas around, like this is where you go to dump stuff. Um, but then there's the whole Peter Hackett thing, who is like the creepiest doctor. Yeah. On a beach um <laughs> sorry but yeah i mean like why insert yourself into all these things and how did he call her mom? like all of these things so yeah how do you think it's suspicious <laughs> and like to say to make up to make up that you run a house for wayward girls just to find out from the mom if she's been found yet it's like what like red flags all over and then to say that the phone call didn't happen when they have record of the phone call happening it's like what is your what was your plan here it, like um, I unless Shannon was his first and only kill and he's just new to it and was like oh I just this girl ran into my ran straight to me and it was like why not and he figured he could get away with it it's like if if you're right near your backyard, that's where she ran off to. At least direct the police to look in that area, or at least let them search your backyard earlier than over a year and a half later. It's like if if you're trying to say, "Oh, I don't look guilty because I let them drain my swamp," it's like, okay, but you waited so long, almost, and you are a doctor, you would know how long it would take for most of the evidence of the body to be gone. And then all of a sudden you're like, yeah, you can come in and check now. It's just like, what a sketch ball. Like, who calls the mom? Yeah. And, but he didn't call the mom. Like, where'd you get that number? It just makes no sense. You're all the way in Long Island and this woman's in New Jersey. And you're calling from near New Jersey, from near her, and saying that you helped out her daughter. In the podcast, they said that one of the reasons he might have called her mom was because um shannon's boyfriend i forgot to write down his name but shannon's boyfriend at the time um went looking for her and they said that he talked to dr hackett so it could have been that he called shannon's mom because he got kind of he found out she was missing from her boyfriend looking for her and then called but also it's like then it would be that your boyfriend, the boyfriend gave him the number, which the boyfriend said he didn't. So it's just, you still don't really explain getting the number and you don't explain this concern, but have just called the police and asked if that woman had been found. It just doesn't make any sense to call the mom. It's he's a sketchball. And I, and I don't understand how they let him, how he passed any of these 
I mean, she's found on your property in the backyard. It just doesn't make any. <laughs> yeah, but like a hello. I don't get how they let him go unless you've maybe connected to something bigger, or maybe he's covered up for people in the past and they owe him one. Who knows? Yeah. I don't. It, it's just very suspicious. But oh, um, and the God, the one that that Billy Jensen and Alexis whatever her uh, link letter did is a discovery plus um, or discovery channel special too. And they, I honestly think that Dr. Hackett did have something to do with it. And because Oak beach and um, Gilgo beach are like exclusive areas, even if they knew like he had done something wrong, they were protecting their, their area right like they, they did not want people coming in and searching they did not want people asking questions it's just way suspicious it's too suspicious so i feel like he was part of it i don't know if he exactly maybe like maybe he killed them and got somebody else to bring the bodies out in the, in the marsh um because he knew nobody was going to look at it but i don't know i don't know but it's it to me that the most incredible thing is that before Shane and Gilbert went missing, nobody was looking for these girls. And then she goes missing and her mother, you know, puts up this huge fight to look for her and they start finding other people, like one after the other, after the other, after the other, and just kind of exposing that area. It that to me is incredible. Um, yeah, but who knows how much longer it would have gone on without right? Kid. Like, there could be more bodies being dumped there today. They can probably mark because, they, you know, they exposed that area. But yeah, I mean, had it not been for Shannon Gilbert going missing, I don't think any of these other people would have been found. Um, yeah, which is like the craziest part that she like could be under <laughs> The saddest yeah. part. Yeah. Yeah, the, the movie is really intense. It's really sad. And I'm I'm glad that they made it because it took me a while to watch it. I honestly didn't watch it until this past week when um I remember when it came out, though, and I was like, oh, that's going to be heavy. And I just kind of avoided it. But then I was like, I'm covering the case. I want to know about more about that. And the movie is primarily all about Shannon. I mean, they do cover the other girls. They introduce the other girls, family members, and, and kind of show how they're all dealing with it. But most of the movie is about Shannon and, and just how, like, the search for her is the only reason we even know about the other girls. And it's really just sad, especially now that I know that about her family, too, about all the tragedy that comes after. It's like, what, what a mess that just came out of these girls just trying to get by and make some money and trying to be like clever about it too. Like going on to Craigslist makes sense for them. And it ended up being the worst thing because there's no trace back to whoever it was. Um, yeah, it's just really, the whole thing is sick that it's still not solved, but hopefully with this new police, I think it's the new police commissioner, um, we'll get more answers since they seem to be letting stuff out. Uh, slowly but they seem to be letting out some things out so um maybe there'll be more to go off of um maybe they can trace it back to the other guy that guy that knew melissa um and potentially that one really creeped me out when i heard this john and with john that last guy he creeped me out like i was like i got chills that guy is weird that like he was just an everyday family man that literally had never been on police's radar until his brother gets caught for something and then he's leads back to these this like these uh rape and murder of two other women it's like that's so creepy that he was going undetected and then he knew melissa from younger i mean out of all the girls out of all the gilgo beach four girls um melissa's sister was the only one was only a victim's relative that was getting phone calls. So the fact that he he knew that family is uh, like it's really creepy. So at least he's locked up now, and it seems that there's been no new 
cases popping up and no no more bodies at least so um that's good but it could also mean that whoever it was is just finding somewhere else now um yeah it's really just a wild and there's so many layers and there's so many bodies and like there's also so many long island theory people <laughs> so that's why sometimes when you look up this one if they say they, they call this person the gilbo beach killer because it's more specific because once you have multiple serial killers in one area you have to be more specific which is sad but that's how that's the world we live in um so it's it's pretty wild i mean i'm curious if anyone if anyone in the audience that or anyone has a, the theory that it's one guy that just changed mo's and that went from being kind of more flashy to you know to now doing things kind of more under the radar and kind of got smarter with tech and stuff or if we believe this like i the theory that like and i think janae mentioned it in the chat too the theory that like this guy the bodies were getting discovered of these gilgo beach four and then another killer was like hey they're not talking about me anymore let me go dump more body parts so they pick up like so they talk about me again it's wild and you're right the fact that like like serial killers could be cloud chasing off <laughs> off of each other is just like what a fucked up world because it, but it i mean it, it it adds up like i mean it's the fact that the torsos were found in a completely different area way before then all of a sudden the other parts come up and they could have been there the whole time but also you know they could have just realized that's where they're searching and decided to go with that because they were pretty scattered compared to i mean i kind of see down this map but the other map was better but they're pretty scattered about where they were so it could just be they like were throwing them out the window into this area but i mean if you live near there i hope you don't go to the beach it's just overly i mean i don't know this the area is a really a beach that you tan at like i mentioned it's like a marsh area so i don't think people like hang out there but i also like can you just imagine trying to go hang out at the beach and just being worried that you're going to stumble across another body? Like, it's just wild that this is kind of what the community is has to get used to at that point. And it's kind of, and if they're linked to it, it's even worse. Like, if they all use this place as a dumping ground for, you know, parties that go south, it's just, that would be one of those, yeah, massive cover-ups that should be, I <laughs> should be figured out, but we'll find out if this police, if this new police chief or commissioner figures out some of that stuff and we get more answers. I hope so, because this is um, frustrating. The whole thing is frustrating. They don't even know what they're looking for. It's like, I don't even know where to go with it. But I, I think the theory I'm the, like seeing the most is that there's two separate killers at least. And one of them being the Gilbo four, potentially being linked back to those other four. If that is the same guy that he moved on, in my opinion, and he's found another place to set up another set. Um, but if it's not that that he stopped because the girls were found. Um, and I, I sadly, I also don't think that Shannon's connected to the case. And I don't think her family does either. Her family was pretty, pretty much believing Dr. Peter Hackett had the most to do with it which makes sense so um he should be locked up at this point but they said he's clear we'll see um but yeah if anyone else wants to come up if anyone has a theory or something way out there um that those are my favorite ones so if you have any more theories if it's a massive cover-up if it's you know if someone knew these girls or is linked to all of them they couldn't find any links but there's possibilities i guess um all that stuff it's a messy lots of layers um, danielle uh, Mac oh danielle danielle do you have a theory well i was thinking it was john I, and i definitely think it's more than one killer but i was thinking that john definitely john yeah with the when the new girl <laughs> yes i think he definitely has something to do with it because he is it seemed and so he knew so much but I was curious if people would put in the chat what who they thought it was, or if they thought it was more than one person too. So I would like to hear that too. But go ahead, Emmy. 
Oh, yeah. I was just going to say, yeah, Danielle here next to me, and she's um, the founder of the club, so make sure to follow her. We're going to be in the next rooms, and then we actually have three rooms today because I'm usually on Thursdays. I had to move it a day because um, something came up yesterday, but I'm usually here Thursdays at 1.30 Eastern Standard Time, um, and I usually go back and forth between a serial killer and a cold case, and Last week was a cold case. This week is a cold case serial killer. It's like double whammy. Um, so I didn't honestly choose what I'm going to do for next week yet. I haven't decided if it's going to be a serial killer or a cold case or if I'm going to go back in the routine. Um, I don't know. If anyone has any serial killers they want to throw out in the chat real quick that, you, that I haven't covered, I've covered quite a bit. But um, either way, I'm going to find something once I close this room and I'll post it. Um, it'll probably be a serial killer, hopefully one that's solved because I feel like I've been doing a lot of unsolved and that stuff keeps me up at night. So we're going to try to find one that's been solved. Um, and, um, I will post that maybe I'll do, uh, I don't know. I, I have a list of ones that I wanted to cover and I'm trying to remember which ones I, I've seen some. Sometimes you go into to like research something and it's like there's nothing really there. So I'm trying to figure out which one of these on the list is one I can cover. Um, I'll post it right after. Actually, maybe I'll do the Candyman. Dean Coral. Okay. Let me make sure that that's something that has some info. Um, oh, yeah. There's, there's info about that. That one's an interesting one, too. Okay. All right. Yeah. So we'll do the candy man, Dean Coral. This one's back in from the forties, early or oh no, yeah, from the seventies. The see yeah. out. I'm not gonna say I think it's the seventies. Sorry, no. <laughs> I read when he was born. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Although so, and it was on like the story was on Mine Hunter. I don't remember which season. What oh, part okay. kind of like they interviewed someone from the story. Um, hey awesome yeah so that was that was you guys got to see that process i just pick at random off my list so we're <laughs> gonna cover deep coral and it seems that um that one at least has more answers than the two from before but if you ha weren't around for the last few weeks there's replays on the club's page as well as my profile um and um yeah make sure to follow the club there's even true crime trivia we do that on sundays and um, we have a couple more rooms today. So if you're, if I got your brain thinking and you want more unanswered questions or more frustration for true crime, yeah. I'll post the room for next week, the uh, Dean Quarrel, the Candy Man, right after I close this room. But um, thank you guys. Thank you, Jennifer, to come for coming up. And it was nice to see you again. Thank you. Here's it's been a voice again too, because it's been a while since I've been able to listen. So, oh, they always oh, love to hear your voice though. Yeah, and I hope that we get back to some rooms from you soon, too, because I love your rooms also. So make sure to give Jennifer a follow. She does rooms as well. So um, thank you, guys, and I will see you next week, next Thursday, um, back here on True Crime Talks Club. Bye, guys.